Okay. Can All right, welcome it? everybody. It's so nice to be here, and especially we're honored to have Professor David Pasig with us. I want to thank Salman uh, Bendayan for helping to organize this event, and Avi Mamie and others who thought of it. Um, we've had Professor Pasig uh, many times in the past. He came and spoken here. He's a good friend of ours. And in the past, he's spoken about uh, precisely what's going on today. Um, I know last time you were here, you spoke about uh, Russia and China and Israel. And uh, we always have your words in mind as we read the news and watch things unfold. Professor Pasig is a professor of future studies at Barilan University, um, head of the department. He wrote many books, including The Future Code. Um, and uh, what he does is he looks beyond the, beyond the news headlines. Most of us, we just read what's going on. Um, but Professor Pasig is looking at trends, looking at, uh, at data, um, big data, small data, um, thinking about the, the psychological motivations of leaders and nations um, and putting together all of that data. So it's no, it's no magic here. Um, it's just uh, using a lot of insight um, to help us. And this is a time when a lot of us feel confused, so many things going on. And to get some, uh, some clarity, some direction, some idea of what we can hope for, what we should worry about, and then maybe what we can do to bring about um, a better outcome. So Professor Pasig, we're so honored. Thank you for joining us. Professor Pasig will present first and then he'll take questions. So please write your questions in the chat and then um, uh, he'll be happy to address them after. Yeah. Thank okay, you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Thank you very much. It's so nice to see a, a lot of uh, faces over there. Uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, thinking about the community also a lot. And I hope to see you again, you know, from time to time. Anyway, let me try and first of all, uh, clarify uh, my lenses, if you wish, with which I'm trying to understand reality. You know, reality is something so uh, difficult uh, to, uh, to make sense of without a very clear methodology with which uh, you at least perceive what you, uh, what you see and make sense of the dots, what you see. You know, Professor, you can't... one second. I, I can't see your picture, your video. You cannot see uh, me? Really? I saw you before. Yeah, you were there before, but now I don't see you. I see myself. <laughs> um, let's see what I can do. Yeah, that's oh, good. Okay. okay. Is it okay? Yes, yeah. that's good. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. All right. So... You know, the most important thing in, uh, in, in trying to understand reality is to be aware uh, of the methodology with which you make sense of the dots and the immense, the huge amount of uh, data that uh, is now being gathered and, and, and described and uh, published all over the world. So let me uh, really briefly explain the with which I'm going to describe what uh, I'm about to share with you. You know, probably uh, we have started a new epoch in history, which is another phase of World War II. It might sound very, you know, general, but the methodology says the following. You know, humanity is going from time to time into aggressive actions among nations. And, 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 and if you are able to see the connections between the dots, between those epochs of aggression and make sense of that, uh, that line, then you're able to foresee things that most of the people really don't, don't think it's uh, logical and don't see how uh, the past can be extrapolated into the future. So this is really briefly the idea that I'm going to, uh, to share with you. I'm going to try and see uh, the history of the last century as just the introduction 
of the 21st century, because this is how history is evolving uh, always. Nothing is detached from, from the past. The past is continuously uh, evolving and taking shape. And from time to time, we see it in different, uh, in different let's say, historical events. So uh, after this very brief introduction to the methodology, I would like to state the following. Uh, we have been in something like 80 years of an amazing, unusual uh, uh, experience um, in, in, in history. Generally speaking, humanity used to uh, go with a paradigm for millennia. And that paradigm said the following, if, if somebody had some resources, that means I'm lacking those resources. And for millennia, people uh, were fighting for those resources in order of, of course, to, uh, to, to make sure that the, their offsprings will benefit and will have better lives than uh, they, they used to have. So for millennia, the, uh, the pattern was the, as, uh, the, as, uh, the following. One group of people saw that the other group of people had something that they, they lacked and they tried to get whatever they lacked, either by uh, political uh, venues and, and tactics or by wars and, 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 and uh, very aggressive actions against those that used to have whatever they had. The pattern of the, uh, those aggressions, generally speaking, was the following. I think we lost him. We'll um, sure I'll log back in. Sorry about that. Does he know? Am I not on? No. Who's in touch with him? Maybe uh, Solomon. Solomon had his uh, phone. Let's help the losers feel that they didn't lose anything. Okay, and this is actually the most important experiment that we have been uh, experiencing in the last 80 years or so, in which we have developed a world system in which each nation can feel that nothing is lacking. They can be part of world economies. If they are lacking a resource, they can buy it from different places, different na other nations. And the world has developed a system in which everybody can trade with each other through a very expensive platform that the winners have developed uh, after World War II, in which the seas, the maritime uh, trade routes are open, in which there are uh, world institutes uh, that uh, somehow bring uh, people to uh, share ideas, to define rules, to uh, bring their uh, differences into, uh, in, into understanding of each other without the need to go to the battleground to bring those differences in an aggressive way. This is the most important ex experiment that we have been experiencing after World War II. And, and, and that experiment was, of course, uh, led by the US that was willing to invest trillions of dollars to build that world uh, platform, global platform, on which every nation can you know, trade with each other, 
uh, world institutions, world trade organizations in which everybody was able to share what they have and buy whatever they, need, they needed to. And during the last 80 years, humanity has gone from uh, about 50 or so nations into about 200 nations nowadays that um, felt a great prosperity in a, a, a pace that we have never experienced in human history. And as you all, uh, uh, you are all familiar with, most of the nations that benefited from that world platform, of course, were the, uh, the, the nations that were the losers in, after World War II, and the small nations that most of the time in history were battled by great other uh, powers. And what we see at the beginning of the 21st century, a platform that has, uh, uh, has gone amok, if you wish, because a lot of nations started taking uh, advantage of, the, of that platform, not just to push away the leaders of that platform, but, but to overcome and take over that platform for their benefit and for their uh, uh, values and for their uh, strength uh, and benefit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is something that we have seen starting to collapse uh, at the beginning of the '90s, because up to the '90s, uh, the the U.S. was willing to invest trillions of dollars on that platform because. Of the, um, of the tension uh, that the, the Cold War with the USSR has brought uh, into the world politics. After the, uh, the, the USSR has collapsed, step by step, the US started uh, understanding that a lot of other nations are taking advantage of that, of that uh, platform and bit by bit, um, the, 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 the U.S. leaders uh, were, were um, trying to retreat from that platform in order for others to take part of the, of, uh, of the burden of that, of that platform. And uh, for example, you know, the U.S. came to, the, to NATO to, ask to, to, to be part of, uh, of the system, etc., as, as we are, you are all familiar with. What happened in the last few years is that platform probably has almost collapsed worldwide. And some nations not only are taking advantage of that, of that platform, but are challenging that platform. And one of the, one of the landmarks of that challenge was when uh, Russia um, invaded Ukraine after signing with Ukraine a very clear treaty that they will not invade, after Ukraine actually uh, gave back all their nuclear power that, uh, that was part of uh, Ukraine before the USSR was, uh, uh, has uh, collapsed. And and, and people started seeing that our nations worldwide started, started understanding that from now on, you cannot count on, on any international treaty. You cannot ca count on a nation that has, for example, uh, wheat, and you rely on that wheat for, for feeding your, uh, your, your uh, people. You cannot anymore rely on that world trade a system that uh, that will uh, you know uh, um, be able to share uh, their resources, even though they want to share your uh, their resources, they will not be able to continue sharing or trading with their resources. And what we see in the last thirty years, actually, is bit by bit that world system is step by step diminishing and. Uh, almost collapsing. By almost collapsing, I mean that we are now at a stage in history in which um, 
groups of nations are forming uh, uh, reliances in order to take care of their needs. Uh, everybody already understand that, that there will be times in which you won't be able to get your needs if you if if something will uh, will go uh, uh, you know astray or or something will happen some some somewhere in the world and uh, the trade routes will uh, somehow by uh, you know a small group somewhere will will be crazy to uh, to you know to launch uh, uh, attacks on uh, on ships etc it's as as exactly we see at the very moment in different places worldwide. I was just, I just came back from India trying to understand the geopolitics of that area in order to, of course, make the, uh, and establish the contacts in order to, to uh, establish the new, um, new kind of, uh, of um, uh, alliances worldwide that will be able to tackle the, the challenges that the system that, that is collapsing will probably bring about in, in, in the future. And I was shocked to see how frightened they are. You know, India is an amazing country. Actually, at the moment, they are the largest, you know, population on earth. Um, and they, they have... I was told that they have about 100 conflicts that are surrounding India. And I was shocked to see how what happened in Gaza really affected their understanding of geopolitics. They told me that, look what happened to you just with 300 you know, uh, terrorists. What will happen to us if 3 million Pakistanis will uh, decide to invade India, and those Pakistanis have the nuclear power. So they are, you know, nations at the moment are very afraid from the collapse of that uh, multilateral and, and a global system in which or through which we were somehow able to bring our differences into somehow discussions and, and, and decisions without having to go to, uh, to the battleground to, uh, to, to make uh, our, our, our point. So what we see at the moment is that the world is reorganizing itself in the, ma the manner we have organized ourselves before World War II. You know, the, uh, we see now a lot of uh, of um, of groups of nations that are forming the one that you are all familiar with in the middle east it is the abraham accord but there are now at least something like between 10 to 15 different groups that are reorganizing themselves in clusters of nations in order to take care of their needs and take, and take care of course of their uh, of their conflicts, if something, God forbid, will uh, you know go astray in the world uh, in world affairs. So most of the people I am aware I'm aware of, and the uh, the the the, re the studies I'm reading and the, and the people I'm speaking with, most of them are saying that we have started about a decade in which the system as we have known it at, up to now will continue to erode and it will have great implications on uh, world trade and world organizations and and wealth transfer etc cetera, etc cetera. and the climax and most of the people i'm you know familiar with are speaking that by 2027 or 2029, at best by uh, 2035, there will be a climax in which the system will collapse and that will be demonstrated by a very aggressive mo uh, move that China will do with uh, uh, their uh, uh, alliances. So uh, this is really briefly, uh, 
uh, a lot of uh, literature that I'm trying to condense in a few uh, minutes. And the idea is to open the mind to see what might happen in the next decade. Some people are saying that we will be able to manage and, and, and fine tune the world order as we have known it, known it after World War II. We will have to do some, uh, uh, some uh, changes in world uh, affairs, in world institutes. Uh, and the share, the sharing of the burden will be a part of much, many more nations worldwide. Some other people are saying that since it's a very chaotic uh, time, uh, nobody knows what will be the new world order that will emerge from the next decade. But the next decade, by all means, it will be very turbulent in many ways. And uh, as we see it, you know, you, you are all fam familiar what's happening worldwide. You see that in any place, almost any, you know, any place you touch upon on, on the globe, you see that things are brewing. And this is a very clear indication that, that you know, the system is in a... Um, this equilibrium uh, uh, state and most of the time when the system is in a missed equilibrium state you know the most uh, the most unimaginable um, uh, things uh, could happen and we know it from history and the worst thing that can happen to us is to say that well uh, we can manage as it used to be up to now we, we can, you know, continue uh, what we used to do up, up to now, but uh, many, many nations already has, uh, have already understood that it's impossible to continue the way we, uh, we've been doing business worldwide. And by business, I mean everything from trade to uh, politics uh, to, uh, um, to, um, uh, agriculture, if you wish, everything, almost everything. I'm not. I'm not sure you are aware of what's happening now in uh, in uh, Europe. But last week, the Prime Minister of uh, Sweden, which was for about 200 years, Sweden was a, a nation that tried to be kind of uh, of Switzerland of uh, of uh, of those. Uh, uh, nations over there, but he has clearly defined that Sweden is about to go to war, and he started, uh, you know, speaking about it out loud so that the populate of Sweden will be um, as much as possible ready for a new kind of uh, aggression that probably will come from uh, Russia. Most of the experts are saying that Russia will not stop in Ukraine, and their aim is, of course, uh, in Poland, and Poland is in 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 a very uh, frightening um, mindset at the moment. They are actually um, quadrupling their investment in uh, in um, in technologies and uh, preparation for for war which is really a, a sign that is, uh, is uh, ringing red and, 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 and bringing a lot of people to try to understand uh, how it might develop that mindset, even though you know, some people think that no, nothing will happen. And uh, even though uh, Putin is saying that he, he be behind, uh, you know, after uh, Ukraine, he doesn't have anything else to, to do, but nobody is believing him as, as we have already seen, uh, even though before he has invaded Ukraine, uh, he was clearly uh, saying that he doesn't have any plans to invade the Ukraine, but nobody anymore uh, believes in those statements. And uh, that in one front, the other front, of course, is the, the Middle East. Uh, that is in turmoil, and this is just at the beginning of of a decade of uh, 
uh, of uh, aggressive, um, unfortunately aggressive, uh, um, you know, landmarks in which Israel will have to uh, to to bring the this conflict into into somehow a, a, a definitive, a clear cut, you know, end or finish at least uh, from point of view uh, from a from a military point of view, uh, there are great attempts at the moment to stop that or uh, to slow down that vector. But I'm not a part of people that think it's possible at the moment. And we're going to see ups and downs in the Middle East. We're going to see ups, ups and downs in the Far East, in the North uh, Far East, in the South Far East. In, the world is really brewing and, and the, the, there are some studies that are comparing this time uh, to uh, pre-World War uh, to uh, uh, conditions, world geopolitics. I'm not sure it's exactly the same thing, but there are a lot of signs that uh, are very, very much the same as before World War II. I'm not trying you know, to frighten anyone here, but the idea is to understand that one epoch of history probably is, has ended and we have started something else. That something else is very hard at the moment to define. Uh, it's very hard to, to foresee how world order that is based on world um, uh, law, uh, 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 collective, or uh, international um, rule-based into and how it's going to reshape itself. I'm part of the people that think that this is how humanity is constantly and constantly, uh, you know, fine-tuning their system. And in, in, in between those epochs, there all, there's always a time that things are, uh, you know, um, are not exactly uh, uh, positive because the negative aspects of the previous world order are already clear to a lot of people. And we need to take care of those negative aspects of the previous world order. The previous world order most um, negative aspect is probably the dominance of one superpower in the, at least in the last three, uh, th three decades. By all means, it's something that is not healthy to a system to have one dominant superpower. This is what drives other nations to um, counter uh, uh, counter about the uh, that uh, sole uh, superpower, and we'll see how things will evolve. In, I think that that's enough for me for the last. Uh, I, I spoke about uh, thirty minutes. I was very very general, but if you have very specific things, I'll be very glad to answer as much as I can. And um, I, I, I hope I'll be able to contribute as much as I can. Go ahead, Rabbi. Let's take some questions from the live audience here. Hi, hi Dan. Nice to see you, as always. Beautiful presentation. Uh, quick. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, professor, um, first question is how does uh, population shifts, whether it's uh, depopulation, you know, birth rates going down and uh, immigration play into all of this? Is that an important component to the unsettling in the world? There are some, there are some experts that put a lot of weight on, on population. I'm, you know, the, actually what I'm trying to say is that there are some experts that think that about 80% of what's happening worldwide is just population. I don't think it's just population, but population is a very important variable, okay? Now, if we are speaking already about population, uh, we know that uh, the world is going through what we call the demographic winter in the 21st century, which means that we are going to pick to 9 billion people by 2030, 
and then we might go back to 6 billion people by the end of the 21st century. China is going to lose about half of, of its population. China will go back to 700 million people. Okay. Uh, um, uh, India is going to lose a third of, of its population in the next 30, 40 years, etc., cetera, et cetera. Okay. And, and most of the time when there is the population is shrinking, that's troubles. A lot of troubles, troubles inward and outward. And because that raises the fears of, of those nations and the fears of those nations, especially if we are speaking about uh, China, China has uh, three main issues she has to address in order to uh, somehow survive the 21st century um, as a superpower. One is food. China does not cultivate, does not, doesn't have enough agriculture to sustain its population by all means. Wow. Okay, that's one thing. China doesn't have water to sustain its industries and its agriculture. That's the second issue. And the third issue is, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the tension that is being uh, um, uh, evolving around and around China, not just in the very, its very closest uh, in, in nations, but also afar. You know, for the last 20 years, China was able to, to develop a, a, an image of a, a nation that comes to help and bit by bit nations start to understand it's not exactly help they are this help has a very high price at the end and there is a sentiment that is growing worldwide that uh, china is not exactly what uh, they were trying to uh, uh, to to develop the image they were trying to develop in the last 20 years. So these are three aspects that they have to take care of and I'm not sure they will be able to take care of. And at the midst of those transition times, most of the time in history, those kind of powers are becoming very much aggressive, especially because their ruling system is based on a, a dictatorship or a, you know a different different kinds of of uh, rulings that cannot bring a lot of ideas into the decision making process but everybody is afraid what the what the leader will say and and the information is not and the data is not going up into the the highest level of decision making and that brings a lot of miscalculations as we have as you have seen with putin that that's the exactly the, the pattern you know when there is a very very uh, dominant uh, dictator everybody around him is afraid of saying of bringing new ideas at the end the miscalculations are uh, augmenting and the price is becoming dire for uh, for mistakes as we are seeing now with Putin and we are going probably to see the same thing with the um, with the Xi Jinping. Most of the experts are saying that the, it takes many many years for the data to to come to the highest level of decision making. We have seen it in COVID. They, they, it took them three years to understand that the, uh, the, their, their way to try and tackle the, the challenge was a disaster. And, and, and when they understood it after almost uh, two years, not three years, it was uh, already impossible to, uh, uh, you know, to overcome the um, uh, the negative aspects. I'm not sure if you are aware how many people died in COVID in 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 China. You know, if you ask the Chinese people, they will tell you about five thousand people died in, <laughs> in COVID. Okay, now we have clear evidence 
that about 135 million people died in COVID. Wow. In China. Whoa. 135 million people. Okay, and there are many ways to, you know, to measure and there are a lot of evidence about, about that. And this is, by the way, they have already, they have already uh, uh, said that their population uh, shrink by 8 million people, 80 million people. Which is, you know, by the by by itself something unusual. Okay, so you know the problem with that kind of uh, of um, of um, dictatorships and uh, is that it takes them it takes them a lot of time to understand what's happening, to come up with new ideas to address, and even though they have an idea how to address the challenge, and. Uh, the, the miscalculations are most of the time uh, um, uh, too many to uh, to uh, to be able to somehow you know uh, um, address them and and come up with the new new ways to uh, uh, overcome their negative uh, outcome. Uh, professor, I have a question. Uh, to continue about the discussion on China. If and when China invades Taiwan, and they probably would win, um, the Taiwan being the biggest chip maker in the world, major chip maker, and if they control, if China controls all the chips, they could literally, uh, I assume, bring down the economy of the whole world. Can you comment on on this uh, situation? Okay. Well, I'm not. I'm part of uh, of the people that are saying that uh, China doesn't have to uh, invade uh, Taiwan in order to uh, to bring havoc uh, to that region. They just, you know, just input a blockade around Taiwan and that will, that'll be enough. They don't have to go and, 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 and you know, their people are saying that in order to invade Taiwan, they will have uh, uh, to, um, uh, to somehow um, um, pay a very dire, price um, in terms of military service and personnel. Uh, a lot of uh, studies are saying that they will have, uh, they will probably have something like a million casualties wow. just in trying to invade Taiwan. That I don't think they will, be, they will need to do it. That's one issue, but it doesn't, it, do, it doesn't matter. A blockade is, is worse by the way than, than invading Taiwan. Because blockading Taiwan means that they will have access to, uh, to, uh, uh, towards, uh, towards the seas of the, uh, towards the US um, uh, shores, which is much more frightening for the US. And they will have, and, 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 uh, and the US will have to address that blockade by aggressive means. That's one thing. The other thing is that um, um, at, the very, at this very moment, many nations are already building the infrastructures in order to, um, uh, to be able to develop um, you know, uh, uh, the technologies that uh, uh, were concentrated in, in Taiwan and are still concentrated in Taiwan. India is taking a very important role, even though I think India will not be able to take that role. But, but the U.S. is investing now a lot of money in order to bring back those industries uh, inshore. Um, but those kind of things are taking time. Uh, I, I believe you are all familiar uh, with the um, um, with what Biden did about uh, more than a year ago, in which he said that everyone that is part of uh, uh, chip industries in the in, in China that is developing the f the the chips that are smaller than five nanometers, okay need to go out of China. And if you are a US citizen, your citizenship will, your citizenship will be evoked. So the US is taking some very aggressive uh, uh -huh. uh, moves 
in that direction to to be in a matter of about five to seven years to be able to almost uh, bring back those technologies and those uh, infrastructures from Taiwan and uh, dissipate them in different countries. We are here running on times. Most of the experts are saying that China will be ready for a very aggressive move by the year of 2027. Some are saying the year 2029, but I'm aware of a scenario that speak, speaks about 2035. If it will be in 2035, that means that they are already devastated. They will not be able to do anything in, in, in at least uh, at the, in, in from that uh, perspective of uh, chip manufacturing. I hope okay. I somehow give you, gave you a, a larger pers perspective of that of that issue. Thank you. Okay, I have one uh, question, Professor Quickie. Well, uh, what Just does remind the... me your names? I you uh, know. I... Mars Dweck. Hi. How are oh, you? how are you? How's your kid? Good. Good. <laughs> good. Still, still at school. <laughs> yes, yes. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, so I want to know about the nuclear capabilities that everybody has now. Which, and, you know, we know the destructive power of that. And really, that can really shake a lot of things up because a very small nation can do a lot of damage with their nuclear capabilities. So what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> What's the question? Does it go nuclear? Does it go nuclear? This, uh... so are, are we going to see? Uh, are we going to see nuclear power being used in our lifetimes? I'm. And who? I I'm part of a group that says that never in history, never in history. Humanity has had a tool and did not use it. Which means it's only a matter of time that somebody will use that, uh, you know, uh, devastating uh, technology. Well, humanity has already <laughs> used it <laughs> in the past. Okay? It's not new. What, I, what, what we are stressing is that you know, there are a lot of people that think that if two nations have nuclear power, there is deterrence not using that power. I'm part of a group of people that think this is a concept that might turn devastating for humanity if we'll stick with that concept. And we need to do as much as we can so that as few as nations will have that technology in hand. And this is a great challenge for Israel at this very moment. And this is the greatest challenge of Israel in the next decade, because it's not just Iran. It's not just Iran. After Iran, it's the Saudis. After the Saudis, it's the Egyptians. After the Egyptians, we're speaking even the uh, Iraqis. And uh, after the Iraqis, it's the Houthis. <laughs> And it will be a devastating, you know, slippery uh, uh, way that humanity can go can go through. Through, if we will not be able to stop that that tendency to acquire that technology, the nuclear technology, um, humanity is going to go to through harsh harsh times in the next two three decades. And I hope that we will have the strength. We, I mean, not Israel, I mean the world. And I believe that, you know, uh, uh, a lot of, of people need, need, to be, need to be awakened to the danger I'm, I'm, I'm speaking at, at the moment about. You know, the deterrence uh, paradigm is, is something that might be uh, devastating for humanity. Go well, ahead. Let's take a, Professor, let's I, take I, a I, question from the chat. Um, Joe Shami asked, many politicians and people believe in an isol isolationist policy in America. 
What are the ramifications of that as, and the value of NATO to the USA? <laughs> well, it, if, if that idea will mature in US uh, politics, that will be a devastating, devastating thing to world economy, to world order, to everything in the next two, three decades. You know, the US has always debated that issue. How much nationalism, how much being, they're not taking care of the world. How, there, is, there is no way that the US can retreat from its policing role of the new era. If they will retreat, if the US will retreat, that means chaos worldwide. And that's what happened always in, in, world, uh, in world affairs. You need a policeman by all means so that the, ru the rule of law worldwide will somehow you know, uh, bring down uh, uh, tension will uh, uh, will be um, um, you know will uh, so Bekitsur, the, the nations need a, a great power uh, to to police whatever whatever the uh, world order is at the time and it doesn't matter which order it is we have a question from the audience here. What should Israel's strategy be to navigate in the coming years? <laughs> what a question. Uh, Israel has started, as I said, 10 years. No, let, let's, uh, let me say something. We have started an epoch of three up to five years of conflicts military conflicts in our surrounding. That's if the world will not go through a, 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 a geopolitical uh, stress, as I have mentioned before. If the world will uh, experience the, uh, the tension I was trying to uh, define uh, earlier uh, with China and Russia, etc., it will take not just three to five years, it will take about 10 years because we are converging with other conflicts that are much more uh, world geopolitical uh, uh, issues. So that's why uh, Biden is so aggressive now uh, with Israel to stop as much as possible the tendency, the vector that has started at the moment in, in Israel, but Israel cannot stop. That's another issue. Okay, but the U.S. understands that the world has started a, a slippery road towards a global uh, conflict. That conflict doesn't have to be, you know, uh, uh, with rockets, all of it. It can be uh, economic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but it, nonetheless, it's, it's a conflict. When the world is in a conflict, the, the, uh, we are all paying the, the, the price of that, of that conflict. If wor the world will somehow slow down the vector of the conflict, then Israel will be able to take care of its uh, challenges uh, during the next three to five years. It depends on internal politics also. Uh, everything is slowing down and it's stretched because of internal uh, um, politics, of, uh, um, of challenges that we, would, we did not prepare ourselves for it uh, because we suddenly understood that we cannot rely on, uh, um, on, on, on the U.S. on a lot of things that we need to start over a lot of our industries and, 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 and it takes time. And through those period, there are ups and downs in, in the conflicts in, in our surroundings. But generally speaking, 
I believe we have started about three to five years of very tense times with ups and downs in terms of military activities. Okay, we are uh, probably going to, uh, to the north by June, at best September or October. And uh, from there, it might be in different forms. It might escalate to a larger conflict. If it will not escalate to a larger conflict, then it will stretch the timeline to uh, to five years, and it will, there will be ups and downs in in the conflict with the with, uh, with the north. Um, I believe that the next stage of the military activities will not be with Hezbollah; it will be with uh, Syria, very specifically about with all the military active activities and sects that are uh, situated in Syria that the Iranians of course are are preparing for that conflict and uh, with Hezbollah it might take a year but some are saying that in any case Israel will be uh, will 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 have to take action by June or at best uh, September because about 100 uh, uh, citizens, uh, that live in in the north um, cannot go back to their uh, to their homes, and it will be very difficult politically uh, to keep them, you know, away from their their homes longer than than uh, six months or so or or a year, and that will be devastating internally politically. So there are here a lot of uh, of vectors that are converging, a lot of. Co- uh, vectors that are colliding and it's exactly the definition of of what we call in systems thinking um, uh, the uh, the mis um, mis uh, in uh, calculations that might you know occur uh, from different sides size that that makes thing that make things much much more difficult in the long run, Thank I, you. I we was have a trying question. to be. I was trying to be very general because you know I'm afraid to uh, to speak up uh, some things. I hope you understood. Are you, are you afraid because of political situations or because of I know because of you know uh, who knows who's listening here. <laughs> I think we know everybody. It's a trustworthy audience. <laughs> I see somebody there. His name is Solomon, I think. I'm afraid from him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kidding. Okay. We have a question on the chat. Before October 7th, the Obama and Biden administrations have been largely ignoring or even appeasing the Iranian regime, explaining that it was, it was uh, not vitally important to USA security. Instead, they needed to focus on Russia and China, which were more serious threats. Do you think that was a mistake? And will the United States now change its focus to try to neutralize Iran? This is the typical mistake that great powers are doing in the pre-phase of world conflicts. They are trying to appease. They are trying to somehow, you know, um, calculate things in a very, very... uh, prudent matter, manner and this is what what brings greater challenges later on and this is exactly what's happening to the US at the moment it was a great mistake from my point of view at least if they were to be very clear at the beginning then things will not you know develop at, the, at it is developing at the moment and what we are seeing with the Houthis are just one aspect of that mistake okay and i believe that you know more and more people in the establishment now in the us believe that they need to be very very clear and very uh, aggressive towards uh, the iranians behind the scene they might continue you know appeasing and and try to to bring the things down and the reason is the U.S. itself is not ready 
for that, that conflict. The, the U.S. also was part of the concept that you know, you can appease, you can uh, somehow understand, you can uh, do uh, policy, politics, and politics will take care of those uh, of those trends. And the, the, the mistake that is always uh, repeating itself in history is that if a great power at the very beginning of a trend is very clear, then that trend tends to diminish and uh, sometimes even dissipate in history. If, if, if it takes to a great power many years to react uh, decisively to a trend, then it is impossible in the long run to, uh, to you know, try and uh, turn back the clock and, uh, and, 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 not not continuing doing those mistakes. Go ahead. A question from the audience here. Will uh, AI be a net positive or negative? AI, okay. AI is another technology that everybody is afraid of and they don't, know, they don't have to be afraid of. And the reason is the following. You know, we as a species, we do not accept our physical and mental conditions as a given. And we are constantly for millennia trying to push the envelope. You know, think about it at the beginning, we said, wow, well, we are, you know, walking four, three, four miles an hour, running six miles an hour. That's nothing. Okay. And so, we were genius enough to uh, uh, to perceive that there is a piece of a rock that is, you know, a, in a way can give us uh, a little bit more speed in 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 in, in traversing uh, space. Okay, I, I I can just imagine how people were totally afraid from that technology. I don't know if you are aware of, but about, about 160, 180 years, when the railroads were at their very beginning, people were afraid of taking trains. And the reason was they were all, a lot of people were afraid of taking a train because they thought that our body cannot move in space you know, 30 miles an hour and our body will explode from just the, the movement in space. We are constantly afraid from new technologies. So for millennia, we were trying to push the envelope. In the last century, we even, you know, developed wings and we conducted trade and wars, etc., with wings that we don't have. In the 20th century, we even push the envelope of our cognitive abilities. We said, our, our memory, that's nothing. I want a much, much larger memory of data. And then we said, it's not enough to have a great memory. We want the ability to analyze great amounts, huge amounts of data and in order to make sense of that data. And we reached a point in which we have developed a language modeling. We are just mimicking. We are mimicking the way we speak, the way we draw. So we are just enhancing a little bit, pushing the envelope of our cognitive abilities, our speech abilities. But this is not the most important characteristic of our being of our existence. The most impor important characteristic is our consciousness. The fact that when I know, I know that I know is something unusual. There is no such a species on this earth that as far as we know, that can, can, can do what I just said. When we don't know, we know that we don't know. 
when we know we know have how valid what we know is 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 our knowledge this is something unusual by all means our consciousness and we have just started you know uh, uh, developing defining what is it exactly consciousness what are the tools with which we can measure it where is it exactly situated is it in our mind is it in our heart is it in our you know body all over where is it exactly so we every time we reach the point in which we have pushed our envelope we let our technologies take care of that aspect of our physical and 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 cognitive aspect and we turned our attention to our next level of 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 be of being or next aspect of being and we are the time in which we are going to go through a very long time you know to fine tune our a way to mimic what we call intelligence but we what what really defines us as human beings are not our intelligence it's our consciousness it's our awareness of our intelligence there are a lot of species a lot of animals that are much more intelligent than you and me but they are as far as we know they are not aware of their intelligence just by being aware of our intelligence we reach the point in which you and me at this very moment from afar speak see each other share ideas no other species was able to do it because only our awareness of our intelligence and our way to validate our intelligence and our way to constantly push the envelope of our intelligence but we are just at the at the verge of a new era in human evolution in which we are going to pay attention to put a lot of new efforts to redefine consciousness to develop tools with which we can measure it tools with which we can enhance it like we have enhanced our memory and our analytical abilities we will be able to enhance our consciousness we are just at the very early stage of a new era of in our development and by the way if you have mentioned it i'm about to publish a book exactly about the next level of our consciousness the next phase of how we develop our consciousness and the tools and how it's going to shape and shape new sciences and new technologies and our civilization the 21st century and of course the the 22nd century are going to be totally different from the 20th century as the 20th century was totally different than the 19th century and of course the 18th century and the most important characteristic of the 21st century is uh, the understanding of what consciousness is and understanding how we can further push the envelope of our consciousness professor you know you uh, could just ask AI was, to write... <laughs> too long you could just ask ai to write the book for you you know yeah yeah sure but it will it will be ai it won't be me <laughs> all right we're we're running out of time i want to conclude with two last questions and i'll ask both of them together uh, so that you can answer both um the second to last question is uh, israel's feeling a lot of pressure towards a two state solution is it viable can it work uh, what other solution um is out there um if not and the last question since publishing the your book 2048 which was published about 15 years ago what developments have surprised you and what did you get right what did you get wrong <laughs> i forgot already the first question what was the first yeah. question <laughs> yeah. the two state the two state solution oh the two state solution well there is there is no rational 
prospect for another state in this region. Another state cannot be by all means a sustainable state that can take care of itself. It will always depend on Israel or on other on other nations that will contribute to that nation to just you know take care of itself by terms of water, food, energy, everything. Okay? That's one aspect of the issue. The problem is that there is so much a, a pressure on Israel to establish another state here in this region. And I don't believe, and I'm saying it with great you know, sadness, I don't believe Israel have the, the, the possibility to constantly, forever, you know, push away that pressure. And we will have to somehow establish another state nearby Israel. What I believe in, which is, you know, devastating, is that it will take some time and we will have to, again, take over that territory. If you wish, take a look at the pattern with Gaza, and that's what we're going to see in the UW Shomron also. But in a matter of 20 years, okay, at the end, though, I believe that there will be some concession, but it will be a concession that will be part of a larger uh, um, peace uh, accord in the Middle East. And we have started that, that, that trend already. Okay, the uh, Abraham Accord is just one step. The other step is with the Saudi Arabia. And, 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 and we, at the end, let's say by... Uh, 2060, 2070, the Middle East will be a block, an economic and political block, as many other blocks in, in, in the world. And Israel will be accepted by most of the nations, not all of them. And there will be some concessions on both sides. But this is the long run. This is 50 years from now. Never, if, if you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm basing my my understanding upon historical patterns. There is no conflict in history that didn't end at the end. <laughs> it some conflicts, you know, took two hundred years, some others three hundred years, but at the end, those conflicts dissipated. Things are changing. Enemies are becoming uh, uh, friends, and and, and 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 friends are becoming enemies. This is a constant pattern worldwide. So we have always to take it into account when we try to foresee somehow the future. Of course, in the very short time, the other challenges are, and the challenges are great. And the other question was. That's your book. Publishing 2048. Well, uh, uh, you know, as, as you probably are aware, if you have read my book, uh, I was able to foresee the invasion to Ukraine. I was able to see the uh, Arab Spring around the, uh, in the Middle East and beyond. And the, the most... Um, some of them, of course, have uh, matured those uh, trends. In my book, I did not um, address uh, the uh, China uh, conflict uh, uh, trends. And uh, I, at that time, I was not aware of the graveness of that trend. And uh, with, 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 you know, with, uh, with some, I have an alibi, alibi because China has become China as we know it at the moment because of Xi Jinping when he took over uh, in 2012. That's when China has shifted uh, its, uh, its, 
its understanding of world affairs and decided to become a great power that, that will take over the world order of the 21st century. So uh, that book in, in, in 2048, I have written it in 2009. It was published in Hebrew in, in, in 2010. In English, it was published in 2013. So at that time, I did not understand how China is going to be, even though there were a lot of, of studies speaking about it, but I didn't pay attention to, uh, to that part of the world. Today, I'm putting a lot of, uh, of efforts to understand uh, the, uh, the driving forces of China and, it's how, and how it's going to play out in the next uh, decade, decade, decade or two. Professor, I want to thank you for your time and sharing your insight with us. I hope we can check in in the next uh, few weeks and months as we th see things develop. Uh, you gave us a lot to be scared you of. Know, um, th thank you so much, but I don't understand. A lot of you are coming to Israel and not contacting me. That's not good. Okay, okay, you, you got know, it. Well, for many I years, I felt a part of the family. Now, you know, I'm not feeling it anymore. What happened? <laughs> You got it. You're right. You, yeah. All right. I'm predicting that we'll we'll be in touch with we'll be in touch a lot more often. Thank you. Thank you for being part of our family and part of and our friends. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Please send me the uh, the uh, the video. Okay. Okay. By chance, we happen to have with us uh, representatives of Kiryat Shmona Hysteria Yeshiva. We visited them. They're not in his. They're not in Kiryat Shemona, uh, uh at present. The army asked them to leave the area just before, you know, uh, in October. And they have. Uh, they have about two hundred fifty students there. Uh, almost half of them are, are, are in the army right now, and they relocated so in central Israel. And, and actually, their location is probably the tallest area in Kiryat Shemona. So that's what the army told them, please leave. We're afraid you're a target. Although in the last few months, 7,000 soldiers who are stationed up there are using yeshiva for showering, for sleeping, all types of different things. They moved out to central Israel. We, we visited there. They hosted us. It was very nice. They're coming back in about two months. And we're trying to organize a committee to help them in, in the, their extra expenses they've had for, the, for this past year. Uh, this is uh, Mikhail Natan. She's the mm -hmm. executive director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he was a student there. He he was in our in our community for a couple of years in Bartai and other and other synagogues. So we'd like mm -hmm. to have, thank them for coming, and hopefully when we come back, we'll be able to have something to help you out with. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi.